All right, hello everybody, and thank you for joining us for the FCA Young Leaders Network uh, webinar series. Today we are having the webinar Personal Finances 101, Understanding the Basics of Your Personal Finances. And with us today, we have an excellent speaker, a gentleman named Doug Brisbane. Doug Brisbane is the Business Development manage Manager for the Seattle Metropolitan Credit Union, the SMCU. He has over a decade of experience with finances and banking. As a business development manager, Doug is responsible for the growth of F SMCU through management, planning, development, and implementation of SMCU's business development program. With that, I would like to introduce everybody to the Personal Finance 101 webinar. Doug, take it away. All right, thanks, Nick. And uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I appreciate you attending the webinar today. We will uh, we'll cover some personal finance 101 topics and uh, answer some questions at the end, um, whether they be on the topics that we cover here today or any other questions that you may have. Um, we can get an answer to you um, during this webinar, and if not, um, some follow-up uh, if, if we need to do so. So let's get started uh, with personal finance 101. One of the key components to understanding a good basic knowledge and, and having a grasp on your personal finances is really understanding that you know financial success is being in control of your money and you have complete control over that there are a lot of factors that will come into play but at the end of the day you get to decide where you spend your money and how you manage that and so a couple things to keep in mind are your income does not determine how successful you are and a lot of people think that, that that's the case you see that you see that everywhere. You see that media and TV. You see friends and family. It's really not that. What really is is your success is determined by the choices and the priorities that you make regarding your money. So let's keep that in mind. Some objectives for today um, really have four of them. One, I'm going to go over how the system works. How do banks and credit unions really make money? Uh, why you should use a budget to help with that personal finance foundation. Grasping the concept of credit, we'll spend a good amount of time on this topic. Saving your money and planning for retirement, which is something that you really can't start earlier enough. Um, on the flip side, it's really never too late to start as well. Those will be the learning objectives for today. So starting out, how does this whole system work? Well, in the essence, banks and credit unions do the same thing. And really, their function exists on as, an, as a kind of a broker, think about it. You put your money in the bank, and the bank lends that money out to somebody else. The people that borrow the money pay interest to the bank, and then the bank pays you interest for keeping that money at their bank or credit union. Now, what's the main difference? How does everybody make money? Well, the loan that you get from the bank, say, is at 5%. Well, the interest they pay out to receive that money is around 1%. Well, the bank makes 4% in income. So that is the primary way that banks and credit unions make money. The other way is to provide services, which they charge fees for. And that's one of the major differences between a bank and a credit union. Banks are going to be more focused on increasing the income they get from fees Credit unions are really focused on providing that service, so you find a lot fewer fees. But at the end of the day, if you keep that concept in mind, that's really how the financial system works. Banks and credit unions, all the major banks, all the major credit unions, we all do the same thing. We all provide the same services and the same products, in essence. It's just who you really like um, to deal with and how you like to deal with your finances, whether it's online, going into a branch, using an ATM, um, fit with the people you work with, is really the major, major difference. All right, let's talk about why budgeting. So you do, you do a budget for a couple of reasons. Achieving your goals is one, using your money efficiently, becoming financially secure, are three of the main concepts of why you'd want to use a budget. If you've known somebody who doesn't use a budget, then two things are going to happen. One, they're going to get lucky, and finances are going to are just work out for them. They're going to make a lot of money. They may not spend a lot, but at the end of the day, they're going to have more money than they spend. 
and you know that happens, and, and people do that. The other scenario for folks who don't use a budget is their life's really going to be in chaos, and you can tell when you talk to them on a personal level. Uh, may even come through on the work on the job site or in lunchroom. Is they're really going to be worried, concerned about you know who do I owe, when do I owe them, and can I pay them? And using a budget really helps answer all those questions and eases those concerns. And that really goes to um, using your money efficiently and achieving your goals and becoming financially secure. The more confident you are about your money, the more secure you're going to feel. Now let's talk about goals a little bit. A few characteristics of goals that are important to keep in mind, especially when you're talking about personal finance. One, you want to have them be specific. You want them to be measurable, you want it to be attainable, realistic, and lastly, you want them to be time-bound. Without those specific uh, attributes of or characteristics of those goals, then you really don't have a well-formulated goal that has a high success of being accomplished. Let's take a look at some. So as you can see here, we have three different types of goals. And we're going to run through the first one in this example. So a short-term goal would be, I want to set up an emergency savings account, and I want to do it within a year. So a year from today, June 11, 2016, I want to feel confident that I have an emergency savings account. And what I've decided is I want $1,800 in that account. I've decided that I'll make a monthly deposit every month into that account of $150, and I'll be there. So that goal is very specific. Let me go back to the other slide here. It's very measurable, attainable. You know, I'll look at my income and expenses as $150 a month attainable. In my example, it is. Is it realistic? Yeah can do that. And is it time bound? Well, it's definitely time bound. So whenever you think about goals regarding your personal finances, keep these things in mind. Make them very specific and really give an honest assessment as to where you can achieve that goal or not. If I set a goal that I want to buy a $80,000 car in two weeks and I only have $20,000, well, that's probably not going to be a realistic goal. And that's an exaggeration, of course. But I really want to drive home the point. Don't be afraid to look at your current situation and say, okay, is this realistic? Is this attainable right now? And if it's not, you may need to make modifications to that goal, and that's okay. The worst thing you can do is get discouraged and stop making goals because you're not understanding or, or not liking uh, what, your, what the facts are of your personal finances. Okay, let's talk about an emergency account. This is probably the number one thing that financial advisors um, tell the people we work with, as well as our financial educators, including myself. Somebody says, what do I need to do to have a solid personal finance situation? First thing we say is, what do you have as an emergency account? A lot of the time, the answer is, I don't have anything. I have some savings, but you know, sometimes I dip into that for stuff I like, and sometimes um, I may put stuff in there. I may put a deposit in there every month. I may not. So what this emergency account is, is three to six months of living expenses. That's the goal. And that's going to change on your situation specifically, whether it's three, five, four, six, uh, six months ago. And you want this there in case an emergency happens. An emergency can come in many forms. You lose your job. Uh, a contract you know, doesn't come through that you want. Your car breaks down. You have a family emergency. Somebody needs um, medical care. You need an emergency repair on your house. You know, true emergencies. This is not for, well, I'd really like to go to Mexico next week, and I, I need to take a vacation. Different, different mindset. Other things to keep in mind. You want this account to be accessible. So you do not want it to be locked in where if you went to your credit union or bank and said, hey, I'd like to grab money out of my emergency account, and they were to tell you, well, you can do that, but we're going to charge you a fee to do so. An example of that would be is having this, this money in an account like a certificate of deposit or a type of an investment account like a stock or a bond. So a great example would be a regular savings account at your bank or credit union or a money market account where you could take the money out without any penalty at any time. 
one of the things you want to keep in mind with the emergency account is you can also add to it while working on other goals. So if you set up a goal of reducing your debt by a certain amount over the next year, you can work on both of these goals at the same time. Instead of putting all of $150 or whatever you've decided in your emergency account, you can take 100 of it, put it in your emergency account, and take 50 and pay off your debt. So it's not something that has to be focused on without other goals being obtained at the same time. One of the things after you start to establish that account and work with your budget, and this is the second most important thing that we talk about when we speak to people about personal finance, is knowing where your money goes. So to do that, you want to track it. And this comes in numerous forms. A lot of people use a simple piece of paper and a pencil, and they write down where they spend their money. They use their debit or credit card statements through their financial institution and categorize their expenses that way. They also keep their receipts so they can track where their money goes. One task that I would, or one challenge I would say to, to the people on this webinar is for a period of 30 days, write down everything that you spend and do not have any consideration or, or get up frustrated as to what the totals are, just track it. Spend money like you normally do, write it down, and at the end of the 30 days, take a look at what you, where you spend your money. You will be surprised and you will learn a lot of information about your personal finances if you do so. Once you've done that exercise and you know where your money is going, create a budget. Simple rule in budgeting, your income, Minus expenses is how much money you have left over. The goal, have more income than your expenses. If you have more expenses than income, then you need to evaluate either your income or your expenses to make that adjustment. Pretty simple. Like I said, budgets come in paper form. You can get online budget forms. Um, you can use a simple Excel spreadsheet. Any way that works best for you. So as we move from creating that budget, having some specific goals, tracking where you're, date, where you're spending your money, we're going to move into talking a little bit about debt. A lot of people have debt. A lot of people get into debt very quickly. A couple of things to remember when you think about debt. There is what we call okay debt and bad debt. We don't call it good debt because at the end of the day, we'd love to live debt free. We wouldn't owe any money to anybody. Okay debt increases value. So your house, maybe your business, maybe your education, that's an investment. So that debt, you're investing in something that's going to benefit you long term. Bad debt, what we call it, decreases in value. Your clothes, meals, vacation, things that are not going to serve you long term. Okay? There's a quote at the bottom here, the abuse of credit is the leading cause of financial failure. And that is 100% true in all the experiences that I've seen. When talk about credit, let's talk about your credit score. How does credit work? Well, your credit score is one of the major factors on, on the decision a bank the credit union is going to make. Will I lend this person money, and what am I going to charge them to do, to do so? Well, your credit, credit score comes from either three, three major credit bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Your credit information is reported to those bureaus from the companies you do business with. Not all creditors report to all three, but most of them do and it's regulated by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So of those three credit um, agencies, you can obtain a free credit report. So another important fact is we recommend you obtain your credit report at least once a year, and you can do so completely free through the website listed here, annualcreditreport.com. Now, it may not give you your score, but it will give you everything that's on your credit report. And that's important because you can see whether that information is accurate. And if it's not, it may be negatively, negatively impacting your credit score. On that report, you're going to see a few different things. Identification, just basic general information. Public records, uh, bankruptcy judgments, liens, if you have any of those. And when you review your report and you see those on there and, and it's not accurate, that's a major uh, negative factor on your credit. So if it's not accurate, you need to make sure we take steps to get that removed. You can see all the accounts you have, your payment history, balance, date open, and then the inquiries. 
who's out there looking at your credit, which is an important thing. On the accounts, they're also known as trade lines. You're going to see who the creditor is, when it was opened, what your payment history's been like, when the last time you used that account, what the balance is, whether it's yours, whether it's somebody else's, as far as a, a joint or an individual account, what the status is, is it closed, is it delinquent, um, and then what your credit limit is. So all of those factors can come together to come up with your credit score. And your credit score, also known as your FICO score, ranges anywhere from 300 to 850. Now on that scale, 300 would present the most risk to a bank or credit union in making a loan to a person with a 300 credit score. 850 would present the least amount of risk to that person or, or to that bank or credit union making a loan to the person. So your score falls anywhere between 300 and 850. The majority of people in the United States fall anywhere from 600 to 800 on the credit score uh, range. Their score is based on a few factors. So the uh, types of credit used. So do you have a mortgage? Do you have an auto loan? Do you have credit cards? That plays 10% of the role. Your biggest component is your payment history. Somebody has lent you money, have you paid them back? Very simple. Best thing to do to improve your credit, pay your bills on time. The next largest is amounts owed. If you have a limit of $10,000, do you constantly have a balance of $9,500? If you do, what that tells a borrower, what that tells a credit union or bank, is you need that money to live. You are relying on this debt to live your lifestyle. And that's very risky for a credit union or bank. If you have a $10,000 limit and you only have a $500 balance or you pay your balance off every month, that tells that lender, you know what, this person does not need this credit card to live off of. They use it for special purposes. They're able to manage this credit. So that is less risk for the, the lender. Then we move to length of credit history. Is this the first card you've ever had? Or have you had 10 cards and how long have you had them? Or auto loans or mortgages or installment loans. And then how have you paid other people going back to your payment history? How long has that been? You have a proven track record of paying people back. And lastly, how much new credit do you have? If you obtained five credit cards in the last month, and you go to your sixth lender, that lender is going to say, hmm, I wonder why this person needs six credit cards in a month. Those are all factors that come up with your, your credit score. That credit score is then reviewed by banks and credit units to decide how much they're going to charge for the loan that they're going to, money they're going to lend you as well as whether or not they're going to say yes or no. How to improve your score? Pay consistently on time. That's the number one way to do it. Keep balances significantly lower than your limit. Keep old accounts open. You may have heard people say, um, close out all your cards you don't use. Well, if you close a card, a credit card that you've had for 10 years and you've had good payment history, then once you close it, that card stops reporting to the credit bureaus uh, the information that you've given them. All of the history you have over the last 10 years, all the payments you've made, they stop reporting that information. And it does not positively impact your credit anymore. So it may pay for you to keep those old accounts open so that you can have that history reported to the credit bureaus. You also want to diversify the types of accounts that you have. If you have all credit cards, no installment loans, as far, such as an account or, or an auto loan or a mortgage. It's good to have multiple types. Now, I'm not saying have a lot, but maybe you have two credit cards and an auto loan or a mortgage if you need those items. Limit the number of credit applications made. As I said, if you're out trying to get a lot of applications, lenders are going to ask that question. Now, this is all in the tone of if you need to borrow money. Now, credit is part of our society, we have to have it in order to buy a house, a car. Most people cannot live a cash lifestyle, so it is a necessary evil. But if you don't need to do anything, any, any borrowing, don't feel that you have to go out and borrow just to improve your credit score. Okay. How long will information stay on your credit? Well, positive information, as I was saying, will stay there indefinitely. And that's to the point of why you shouldn't close all of your old accounts. 
Most types of negative information will stay there for seven years from when it was first reported. Chapter 7 bankruptcy will be on there for 10 years, and collection accounts will stay on there for seven. So the decisions you, you make about your credit, they have a, lot, a, a lasting impact. Um, when, when we pull a credit report and we see somebody's had a bankruptcy, uh, that's, we stop our, our process and really look into the parameters around that. So it's important to pay attention and try to prevent um, negative information on your credit report. Okay, so we've gone through kind of what makes that credit score. I want to go through a little example of what happens if you manage your credit well and what happens if, if you've had some bumps in the road. So let's say that we're going to buy a 2015 Chevy Silverado. All right, pretty nice truck, becoming handy for our, our jobs here. And just looking at some of the, the stuff on the Chevy website, it's going to cost us $40,000. So it doesn't have all the bells and whistles, um, but you know, it does have electronic windows and, and door locks. We're going to put $5,000 down, so we're going to borrow $35,000. Now to figure out how much your payment's going to be, you can use loan calculators that are on, on, on the web, bankrate.com, our website, smc.com. You can Google just car loan calculator, and you'll be able to input these um, numbers and it will tell you this is how much you're going to pay every month. So I did the math on this, and let's pretend that you've taken care of your credit. And the bank credit union is only going to charge you 3% on this loan. So we're borrowing $35,000. We'll go for six years for a term, and your rate's going to be 3%. Your truck payment is going to be $532 a month. Okay? It's not bad for a $35,000 loan to get your $40,000 truck. Well, let's say you haven't handled your credit and your, the dealer or bank or credit union is going to charge you 22%. That payment is $880 a month. So you're saving $348 a month if you're getting that loan 3% compared to 22%. That is a lot of money. That's another car payment uh, for some other car for a family member um, that you may need to, you may, you may need to buy. So this obviously is a little bit of an exaggeration in the variance between 3% and 22%, but this is out there. Dealers, third-party financial institutions are doing car loans every day right now at 22% interest because credit scores are down to the people who have not handled their credit. So this is good information to have, and I, I bring this up to show you how important it really is, a real-life example of the issues with that. So moving on, as I'm checking my timer here, let's talk about credit cards. So let's say if you had a $2,000 credit card balance and 19.8% rate, which is an average rate for a credit card holder in the United States, your minimum payment's 2.5% of the balance for $20, whichever is higher, it's going to take you 14 and a half years to pay off that balance if you make the minimum payment. If you made those minimum payments, then it would cost you $2,848 in interest alone. So at the end of your 14 and a half years, you've paid $4,848 to only get the benefit of $2,000. So this drives home the point, one, if you can get your credit card rate lower than 19.8% by having good credit, that will save you money. Also, if you use your budget appropriately that you've built, you're able to make your credit card payments greater than the minimum balance, you're going to be able to reduce the amount of interest that you pay. So a couple of real life examples on how having good credit can really impact your financial situation. All right, we've talked about budgeting a little bit. We've talked about credit. Let's talk a little bit about retirement. Now, some of you may think, well, retirement is a long ways away. Some of you may say, I'd like to retire today main thing about retirement and savings is it's never too early to start. The best time to start planning for retirement is the first day that you start working. And if whether you own your own business as a, as a contractor or you're working for somebody else um, in your field, you really want to start thinking about that as soon as possible. Because the sooner you start, the better, the better it's going to be down the road because you're going to get the benefit of what we call compounding interest. 
as well as having a general understanding of what it's going to take to retire. So, first thing you do is determine where you stand. That allows you to start your to establish your starting point. Work on a budget. You know how much you're spending. You know after your savings. You know what your credit's like. You take a look at what you own. So all of your assets, whether it's a house or a car, um, or may may not be anything. And then you subtract what you owe. So do you have an auto loan, credit card? Um, balance? Do you have a mortgage? And that's going to establish your net worth. Now, your net worth is important because when you retire, um, you're not going to be having as much income traditionally as when you're working. So if you have a clear understanding of what your net worth is, then you'll be able to plan how much money do I need every month to bring in to uh, maintain the lifestyle that I need. And the earlier you start with that planning session, the easier it is to get there. So one of the things that after you've done your budget analysis, you've looked at your credit, is to start realizing, okay, I've set some goals. I want to retire by this day. How am I going to get there? One of the easiest ways is to live within your means. We have a, a suburb in the Seattle area um, called Kirkland, and there are a lot of young, um, young people, young, young tech people who work in Kirkland, and we call them, um, a group of them, $30,000 millionaires. And the definition of a $30,000 millionaire is somebody who makes $30,000 a year that spends money like they're a millionaire. And Kirkland is a very affluent area, so they live outside of their means, which is going to put them in a bad, bad place for their retirement, their budget, and so forth. So if you really keep this in mind, you live within your means. You can increase your income by means of, of your job, if that's possible. Really, you want to pr prioritize your spending after you've done your, your budget analysis, look to your credit, set some retirement goals. And to do that, ask yourself, <coughs> excuse me, can I reduce what I spend every month? Can I substitute what I buy for something that's maybe cheaper? Can I postpone it? Not buy it today, but maybe I'll buy it in three weeks after I get paid and after I've made my savings deposits and paid, my, paid off some of my debt. Well, can I completely forego it? So you want to keep these things in mind. If you're asking yourself these questions when you're making purchases, then more often than not, your answer is going to be, yes, I can reduce the amount I'm going to buy. Yes, I can actually buy an alternative that's maybe a little cheaper. Yes, I can actually postpone this. I don't need it right now. And actually, I can forego it. I actually do not need it at all. So if you have that mentality, it's very easy to move into the final, one of the final concepts here. And this is probably the, the third most important thing we tell people. One is, of course, we went back to um, some of the earlier concepts in this, in this webinar, tracking where things go, understanding your personal successes, is in your control, but paying yourself first. When you create that budget, one of the first line items you put on there should be your savings account or even your name. If you pay yourself first by putting money in your savings account, which is that's how I call what I call paying yourself first, then you are the number one priority amongst all of your other bills. Now, of course, you want to set yourself up in your budget where that you pay yourself first, but you can also pay all of your other obligations because we want to maintain that credit score and start planning for that retirement. If you do this and have this mentality, you're going to be able to reach those goals a lot faster. You're going to make it a priority to set money aside so that those goals don't get pushed away every month. The opposite of paying yourself first is, of course, paying yourself last. And what often happens is, end of the month, and I'm guilty of this too, if I don't keep this mindset. You'll pay all your bills, and it'll be the 30th, the 31st, and you'll okay, how much money do I have to put in the savings? And more often than not, it might be zero. It might be only $100 when your plan was to put 200 in. But if you would have done that ahead of time, then you would have already made that a priority. So a key component, savings, it, it enables you to reach your goal if you pay yourself first. Some guidelines, you know, general rule of thumb, save at least 10% of your income. But really, it's really specific to what your goals are. When you want to retire, 
what are your goals as far as paying down your debt? What are some other financial goals of maybe buying an automobile or buying a house? How much do I need to save? So that 10% can vary depending on where you're at. Weigh instant gratification against ultimate gratification. Okay? Instant gratification is, yes, I want to go on that vacation with my friends. Ultimate gratification is buying a house in Mexico so that your grandkids can come and see you when they're on vacation. That is the biggest difference. If you can put yourself in that position, would I rather have instant gratification and take a week, or would I rather have years and years of family vacation in my, my house at a, at a great resort in Mexico or, or wherever you'd like to go? Please keep that in mind. Don't procrastinate. Start now. As I said, it's never too early. It's also never too late. Please don't fool yourself in thinking, well, I should have started sooner, um, so it's not worth it. It's always worth it. Use auto deduction, auto withdrawals, set things up automatically. Don't rely on yourself to manually do it. It's set up automatically, you don't have to worry about it. Things get taken care of. I mentioned compounding interest. Compounding interest is an amazing concept because when you put money in your account and interest is paid from banks and credit unions, you keep paying you money on that interest that we've already given you. And the earlier that process starts, the more money you're going to make. Um, your, for, your future is worth spending a little less today. That goes back to that concept of instant gratification versus ultimate gratification. So you really want to think about those things. Um, it's never too late to start, never too early. Lastly, does that help? Walk into your local bank or credit union and say, hey, I want to talk to somebody about finances. And they'll sit down and talk with you if it's a good, if it's a good place. If, if they give you the cold shoulder or say, oh, you need to buy something or, or get an account with us to do that, you know, thank them for their time and go find some somewhere else. I, I always strongly recommend credit unions. Um, our foundation is based on education. So if you can find a local credit union, go Go to that if you, uh, you know, want to reach out to me directly. You uh, definitely speak over the phone or email. But you get use help, use your resources, get some help. Um, ask your friends and family. Do you know a financial planner? Do you know estate planners? Um, do you know accountants? People who are knowledgeable in the field. You know, have a conversation with them. They're more than willing to share. And then if you're a self learner, there are uh, a lot of resources out out there as far as seminars, books and magazines, internet. Um, one thing I, I do want you to keep in mind with all of those is make sure that you're not paying for any of that stuff. If you're paying for that stuff, typically there's an angle, there's, there's typically some bad information. But there is so much free information out there regarding finances on the internet through seminars and books and magazines that you should be able to stick with that and get some quality info. So with that, we get to the question section. Um, we're going to move to that in a second. And I really want you guys to just remember, it's never too early to start thinking about this. You're always, you're in control. You have other factors that come in there, but you make the decision. We talked about budgeting. Uh, we talked across the concept of credit. We talked about retirement, how to save money for that. And really think about whether or not you want to look down the road far enough, whether you're willing to give up maybe a little bit of gratification today. So with that, I'll turn it over to some questions that we may have um, about the topics we've covered, or if you have any questions about any other financial topics uh, maybe that we didn't cover today, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, th thank you very much for uh, the presentation. Um, one of the topics um, that comes up for the contractor community in uh, relation to credit, oftentimes these contractors maybe operate on cash or um, show their earnings as a small amount individually. And so they have trouble raising their credit score to borrow personally. What are some tricks that our contractors can do? I don't want to call them tricks, but what are some practices that our contractors can do to help raise their personal credit score when maybe they're not showing a large income on their personal return? Yeah, that's a, a great question. We see that as well. Um, 
tracker, you have to handle both the, so I want to build my credit score and um, deal with ramifications of taxes and, and income. So when you're a, a contractor, you may be operating as a sole proprietor or, or a limited liability company or a corporation. Uh, banks and credit unions are really going to look at you, the person, um, as a person. Hold, hold on one sec. We're getting a little bit of feedback. Um, if your microphone is unmuted, do you mind just muting it real quick while he answers? Thanks. All right, go ahead, Doug. Sorry about that. Okay. So you, you have to weigh that um, that component. You know, do I report every amount of income I'm getting, or or, or do I take a larger salary from my company um, to show that I make money so that I can borrow money? Um, you know, it's a, it's a tough scenario. The biggest recommendation I have is a person needs to make sure that their personal credit outside of their business is in good shape. And if it is in good shape, then you can go to a bank or credit union and say, here's my business. Here's how I handle my accounting. I don't take a large salary every year. Um, I take a smaller amount. Here's the money that's going into the business. And with a good credit union or bank who's willing to sit down with somebody and look at a small business, they're going to see the cash move through the business and not necessarily end up in the, the, the owner's hand. But if that owner doesn't have good credit or hasn't handled their personal finances in a good way, then the bank or credit union is going to ask themselves, well, if they're not willing to do that on a personal level, how are they going to be willing to pay me back on a business level? So my, my answer to that question is make sure that that credit is in top shape. To do that, first thing is to pull that credit report through annualcreditreport.com and see what's on there. Make sure it is accurate. If it is accurate, use those credit accounts, pay off those balances. Um, do not close the accounts uh, that you've had for a while and slowly uh, you'll start to build that score or maintain that high score that you, that you already have. Do we have any other questions out there? Yeah, Doug, uh, quick question on your uh, net worth discussion. You know, so I'm a 30 year old, I have a house, I have a loan payment on that. You know, I'm basically I've got negative net worth by quite a bit. Okay. Um, yep. You know, how, how often do you see that situation, uh, especially with younger folks who are trying to save, but, you know, they're looking out at that net worth number and they see it as a negative? Well, we see that quite a bit, and we've, we've, we've seen that quite a bit over the last few years in the, in the Seattle area. Now, um, fortunately, in this area, our housing market has, has increased dramatically, so we have fewer and fewer people who um, their net worth is dramatically reduced because of the value of their house. But when, you, when you're looking at a, a house putting you in the red as far as net worth is considered, if, if, the only time that's really going to negatively impact you is if you are really, if you're going to be selling that house in, in the short term, which therefore that house is worth less than what your mortgage is, then that, that's going to be a, a problem when you try to sell it. But as far as, you know, if you're planning on staying in that house and you want to develop your personal finances, you know, you're, you're going to look down the road um, from a long-term perspective. And your house may be, you know, less than what your mortgage is at, at this time, but you, you may feel that your house is going to eventually be worth more than what your mortgage is. And that's okay. Internally, you can say, that's all right. Um, my negative net worth is, is going to be fine right now because I'm looking at a 10-year um, – timeline or a 15 year timeline um, or, or 20 or 25 and by that time I'm going to be paying down my mortgage and my value of my home hopefully is going to go up and a good example of that is you know three years ago we had a lot of people who were their value of their their home has increased you know fifty thousand dollars over three years and they didn't do anything it's our housing market that changed now depending on where you're at um, that may or may not happen. So it's really not 
it should not discourage you as far as a net worth standpoint. And if you go in to talk to somebody and they say, what's your net worth? And you tell them it's you know, negative 25000 or negative 125000 you go into detail as to why that is. Also, a good way to do, to, to really look beyond that, is take the, um, the house and the mortgage out of the equation when you consider the net worth. Really, you're not going to be able to control that house value you know, immediately, and your mortgage is the way it is unless you get a refinance. So as far as your personal finances go, okay, how can I really impact these other things that I can control? Let's remove the house value and the mortgage from the equation and look at it um, from that perspective, and then you can make some positive changes that you actually can control. <laughs> Hey Doug, Bob Weaver, I got I got a question for you from the budget standpoint. Yep. You talked about the savings um, mm -hmm. um 10% of your income to uh, do that initial set aside. Is there yep. a rule of thumb for the other categories like uh, um, you know, say uh, housing, food, uh, credit card, stuff like that? Are there rules of thumb out there for those um, items as well? Oh, good question. And you know. There are general rules around as far as, hey, you know, of your budget, maybe 45% should be to your mortgage or 35% should be to your mortgage and then 25% you know, to your food. But when we start to look at different percentages as to where you're allocating your budget, we tend to not put too much stock in those percentages uh, when we're talking about expenses because it varies it varies so much on the individual. I mean, people have different lifestyles. And people, some people who are, are really into, you know, healthy eating and, um, you know, getting the best food from the, the best grocery store, you know, that food budget might be 50% of their income. And somebody who's, who's okay with, you know, a different, different food quality or different um, kind of lifestyle, that food budget may only be 25% of their income. So one of the things that we recommend, instead of saying, you know, hey, here's a hard percentage on what your food or utilities should be, is really to make sure that that person um, has gone through that tracking exercise we mentioned er I mentioned earlier of identifying where that money is going. And in, when something pops up after they've tracked out and they tracked it out for 30 days, they say, wow, I spend you know, 50% of my, my budget on, um, on, on the grocery store. Okay, well, why do I do that? Well, because it's convenient and it's the closest grocery store, that's why I spend that money. Well, you could spend, you know, 10 more minutes, go to a different grocery store and spend only 30%. Or you're going to realize, you know what, that's very important to me. Going to that store, buying that food is very important. I'm going to keep it that way. So I wish I could give you, Bob, a, a, you know, a pie chart like we did for the credit score, but really you want to leave that up to the individual because it's going to vary dramatically depending on what your goals are. Very good. Thank you. Doug, is there a danger to having uh, too much available credit, uh, like lines of credit? I mean, you talk about the drawback yeah. closing things, but is there a drawback to having too much open credit? Yeah, there, there's a slight a slight possibility of where a bank or credit union is going to say, okay, if this person has $100,000 available to them, let's say it's over, you know, they have 10 credit cards, $10,000 a piece, then they could potentially go out and max all of that out. And then are they going to be able to pay me back? So there is a, a line and a balance you want to obtain with how much open credit you have. So uh, a good recommendation would be if you have your mortgage, that's fine. You have a, a couple of car loans, that's fine. But open credit, so we're talking credit cards, maybe a home equity line of credit or a personal line of credit, is probably you would want to limit those to two or three um, at the most if you're not, you know, not required to have those as far as, you know, living on your expenses, which hopefully you're not. And then, you know, depending on how much income you have, you know, dictate the limit. But if you keep those accounts to two or three, you're probably not going to put yourself in that situation 
where a bank or credit union says, wow, if this guy maxes out everything he has, we're going to be in trouble here. But it is something you want to consider. And if, if you've established your credit and you're in that position, it may be worth closing out one of those older credit, card, credit cards that you have um, to, to make sure that you don't have too much credit out there. Thanks. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Are there any more questions out there? Well, Doug, I want to thank you very much for joining us and uh, being a part of the Young Leaders Network webinar series. It was a very informative presentation. Um, we will share this presentation online at finishingcontractors.org's uh, Young Leaders Network webpage. It'll be posted in the next week or so. So please uh, look out for it. And with that, I'd like to close the meeting. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. All right, thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you. See you in a couple weeks, Doug.